Hello and welcome to another new type of video. This is what we're calling terminology, what I'm calling terminology. In a moment, I'm going to be chatting with Jeff Woodstock. He's a stringer. He was on the Stringers chat. And we're going to be talking about the terminology related to the racket and strings. Hopefully, you'll find it useful. As I say at the end, um, if you've got any questions about it, about the terminology, it is, if there was a piece of terminology that we used that you didn't hear but you want to, uh, know about it put it in the comments and we'll do our best so let's jeff and i get started all right then so let's get started let's pick up a racket we've got the rackets in front of us tell me the first thing that you want to talk about jeff okay so i i think in um bracket terminology 101 quick mm -hmm. run through yeah um you see, me all right? you see the racket all right on the screen can you yeah perfectly um, so racket obviously that's the whole thing yep that bit yep head that bit, heads, uh, the terminology we usually use. Uh, so the tip at the top, throat at the bottom. Uh, this one that I'm holding up here is an open throated racket. So I think the one that you've got closed throated, which means that it's got uh, a bridge piece across here. Actually, I'd like to disagree with you immediately. Okay. <laughs> All right. There is a misconception in squash about open throated and closed throated, and I think I'm right. This is a closed throated racket. This is an open throated racket, and what you're holding is a throatless racket. Okay. Yeah. That's, <laughs> if you want to... that's what I've been. That's what I've been um, taught all of those years. Because this throat is there's like a solid piece. This has the open, and then this would be teardrop or uh, throatless. Now the reality is that. Maybe we just change that termino terminology because you don't get any closed throated brackets anymore. So if we want to sort of work like that, I'm okay with that. But being I'm happy, happy to be chastised and educated. If, uh, <laughs> but I always refer to them as open throated. But hey, we're, we're both off the same. Okay. Now you you made a, a movement like this a little bit earlier, and, and yep. I don't know what you were saying. Were you saying that that was the? So I'm saying. This area here is, is what I would defer, defer as or call the shaft. Yeah. Right. Now, in my case, is that here or here? Um, I would say up to the bottom of the... Uh, so where the, the joint and comes. I would go that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So where the... where the Okay, that you call that the, the, the shaft? I'd call okay. the shaft. All right. Yeah. Uh, and then you get various different shapes of shaft. So you've got kind of... This one's corrugated. You get oval ones, yeah. you get uh, oblong ones, squashed ones, yeah. not flat ones. Um, yeah. And I'm gonna gonna jump back to before you were born. No, okay, not really. But <laughs> this is like a, a very early, one of the very early graphites, and this is just literally a rectangle with yeah. curved edges. So yeah. Yeah. very, very simple. Okay, and okay. also very quickly, I've got this one here, which is. Uh, I think it's circular, completely circular. It changes shape from the, the, the bottom, but but yes, plenty yeah. of different shapes on the shaft. Yeah, that's what they that's that's what I play around with, and that's what makes the makes it fun to look at different rackets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you're going to um, the head, then yeah. um, we said tip and throat, uh, shoulders. We would normally refer to as these okay. two bits. All right. Shoulders. Yeah. Um, that's classically where you get breaks on squash rackets where people hit the wall uh, yeah. and it breaks the shoulders. Yeah. Um, then you've got the string plane or string bed, which okay. is all of this, made up of main strings, which are the strings that go vertically, cross strings, strings that go horizontally, um, and then string in pattern um, would be uh, how, how the manufacturer defines which of the holes in the racket are for a main string, which ones are for a cross string, which ones are for tying off, um, and um, sometimes you get shared ones. So like on this Prince racket, you can see there's a main and a cross string going through the same hole. Okay. Um, they also so use that to... Just to interrupt, so, if you yeah. were given, for people who don't know, if you were given a frame, mm -hmm. it is quite difficult to know what the stringing pattern is, isn't it? Uh, so if the strings aren't in there, yeah, and you've never seen this frame before, a completely empty frame, then yeah, um, 
sometimes it can be tricky to to figure out what, where which grommet hole is for what. Yeah. Um, if it's been strung before, then the grommets will be deformed, and you can see. Yes. Usually, okay. in vertical. So but it, it could have been strung wrong, and uh, I've seen that plenty of times where someone's put in a, a cross string where a main string should go. Um, okay. And let, let's let's uh, let's um, talk about that very briefly. You mentioned the word grommet. Mm -hmm. So let's let's define that immediately now, please. So grommets are uh, so the holes in the racket uh, on the side of the racket are filled usually with plastic. Yeah, bits. Like, Can't take mine out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's normally for a squash racket you'd have one grommet strip that goes up each side and yep. then a bumper strip like that that the goes top. across the. Top. Yeah. Like I mean, would would you define the shoulders to be where the bumper guard starts and finishes? No. The shoulders would be a little bit higher. No, no, because it, it it depends depends on the yeah, so some some people's bumper strips are longer than others. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. No, I wouldn't need that as a as a as a starting point for that. Okay. Um, Going back to um stringing patterns, can you show me the um uh, Prince racket, please? Okay. Yeah. Now, viewers, if you don't know, uh, this this stringing pattern is significantly different from this because mine and the previous one, I think, they were perpendicular. They were horizontal completely, and whereas this is different. So what would we call this? So that I'd call a fan pattern. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And are See, those... Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So, so, the, so the outside main strings are longer than on a conventional racket. That's okay. Better. Because the they all go down to the same yeah, point. All go, down, all go down to a point. Yeah. Sometimes they have a, a bridge piece like that. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't got any. Uh, there, there are other fan patterns that go through grommet holes. Uh, okay. Of those to have right. at the moment. Okay. So there's no grommets on that particular print spray. They're not needed. Uh, not not on the throat piece. No. No. Sorry. No. That's what I meant. On that throat bridge piece. Yeah. No, there's no grommets there. Um, so the grommets. The, the purpose of them is when the when you drill a hole through graphite, it creates a sharp edge, yeah. uh, and you string to touch a sharp edge. Um, yeah. There's no hole drilled there, so they don't need. They don't need. No, they don't need it. Now, are those the only two, only two types of stringing pattern in a sense perpendicular? Now, I'm using that word. I don't know if that's the correct word. Perpendicular or fan? Are those the only two types? Uh, in the squash world, yeah, I haven't come across any any others. Um, you get some kind of like. Odd variations uh, where, like in, in tennis, they'll put rollers uh, in instead of grommet holes, and sometimes you see the string wrapped around the outside of the frame. Okay. But in school, uh, I haven't come across. We don't. We um, don't sort of see that. And, and, and I can't. I can't remember we, whether we talked about it in the sort of you know the stringers chat. There was this racket that I saw that was diagonal. The strings mm -hmm. were still perpendicular, but they were you know they were transposed or whatever the you know. Yeah. Is that legal? As far as I'm aware, it is. Yes, but I've it's only not got done in squash. No, no. I mean, the, the reason they did it in tennis, I believe, uh, is to um, generate more spin. Okay. Um, and because that's less important in squash. Less important in squash. Yeah. Whether it actually does generate more spin, and uh, we've had a little conversation about uh, manufacturers. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I I remain skeptical. All I know is they are horrible to string. Oh. Okay. All because right. because of that geometry, all your mounting points are in the wrong place. And yeah, uh, when oh, my one person okay. comes in with that racket, my heart sinks. <laughs> and when you say mounting points, you are talking about where the racket touches the stringing machine. Yeah. So uh, when you're stringing a racket, then um, various different mounting systems, but uh, the ones that I use, so there's two mounting points here and here, yep. two here, okay, and then on the top and one on the bottom. All yeah. right. And when I was young, again before you were born, the squash pros that I used to know used to string the rackets by hand, and they used to have this sort of piece of wood that they used to twist, yeah. and then they put <laughs> something in the hole to stop the string from um, becoming yeah. loose, and then wrap it around the next one. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's just an all, and then and then you have to do. That, uh, yeah, it sounded the same. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So following on from these stringing patterns, we've got the basic idea, we've got the perpendicular or we've got the fan pattern. But we've also mm -hmm. got different numbers of strings per main or per, per cross. Do we have different yeah. words for those? I know we use numbers, 
16 oh. by 19. But are there any yeah. different words? Uh, so de- density, string string density. Okay, you do, yeah. You that being used. Um, uh, one that I like is string bed stiffness. Um, okay. Uh, determines uh, how that acts all as a, all as a system. Um, so depending on your string density, uh-huh. uh, so if you put strings in there, uh, then it, it's stiffer. Okay. That strings is more, it's more open. All right, okay. Yeah. And of course, there's a limit. I mean, I'll put my racket quite up close here. There's a limit mm-hmm. to how close the holes can be. I mean, That's you, right. could, you could put them like right next to each other, but just like windows on an aeroplane, you then yeah. lose structural integrity and the racket becomes weaker, in effect. Yeah. So yeah. I suppose what the manufacturer is trying to do is get them as close as possible without causing any weakness in the frame. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, that, that how, how close they put them together to, um, affects the stiffness of the string in yeah. different places as well. Or, or affects the stiffness of the string bed, I should say, rather than the string. Um, so like, for instance, uh, that caracal racket I've got there, you can see that's quite big spacing in the throat. Yeah. And in, the okay. the racket, in the middle of the racket, it gets quite close together, and then it's wide again at, at, Open the, top. at the top. Yeah, because these strings at the bottom, they don't, hopefully, you're not hitting the ball ahead there, but it still has a small effect on how the ball responds when it does hit the strings. Yeah, yeah so the yeah. ball ran the string based on how the whole string bed works. Yeah. yeah so okay. it works as well. Yeah. Now, I don't have it. It's in the bedroom. I was a bit stupid not to bring it. But I've got a, a racket where the grommets or the holes for the string are not in a line. They are offset slightly. Is that something that's done nowadays? This racket is 35 years old, so. Yeah, uh, not, not that I'm aware of. No, no, I don't see that very often. I mean, I, I, the, the idea of that, I think, was to lock the um, outside main string in a bit more securely. So. Right. And nightmare to string because the, it's quite a hard weave having to go up and down all the time. But yeah, yeah, yeah I don't see that very often. All right, okay. Not, session, yeah. All right. So um, the whole thing, I don't, I don't even know if we, we talked about it. The whole thing is called the frame. I mean, <laughs> maybe we should have started with that. And yeah. we've got balance, and I'd like to talk about the balance now. Do you, you, you go ahead, and then I'll, um, I'll ask. Okay, you. My, my take on the balance, so you've got head heavy, weight towards that end of the racket, head light, weight towards that end of the racket. Um, your head balance point being referred to, so as you did, you just did it there, where you, you try and balance yeah. the racket on your, on your finger. Yeah. Uh, another way of doing it is to hold the racket like that and try and find where the balance point is. Uh, yeah. And the manufacturer will define that as a distance, which is the distance from the bottom of the racket to where your finger is. Yeah. Balancing it. Yeah, okay. point. And um, all squash rackets have to be 645 millimeters. Uh, I think it's 680 something. It's oh, okay. 8685. And there is difference in rackets. I mean, I'll put these together. I'm just going to show the camera. If mm-hmm. I, well, I'll do it upside down. That's the difference between these two rackets. So some rackets are shorter than others. Now, maybe one of these is beyond. What it's supposed to be I, I, I can't say i've measured it and going back to the balance point you'll see two pieces of uh, tape here what i do is when i get a racket to test the first thing i do is i test its weight and i test its balance with no extra grip on and then as soon as i put uh, another grip on because you nearly always need another grip the balance point changes and i think that's worth noting that as soon as you put an extra grip the balance point will move closer towards the handle because of course, if you have like a lot of weight here, so um, the balance point that manufacturers talk about is before you put any handle, and maybe even without the strings, to be honest. Yeah, and I think um, probably without the grommet strips as well. Yeah, yeah, um, the weight will definitely be without the strings and without the grommet strips, so probably mm-hmm. the balance is as well. So when you see a racket, when I say you, I mean the viewers, not you, Jeff, um, and it says that this racket is 130 grams or 110 grams, be aware that it is without anything. And I have heard that some manufacturers even remove the, um, the grip itself. Probably not yep. the resin, if that's what it's still made of. Um, but, okay, that's fine. Yep. All right. Yep. Okay. And the shape of the racket has little or no difference to the balance point? Mm, uh, well, I mean, obviously, where they lay the graphite 
makes a difference. So if they put more graphite in the top, then it'll be head heavier. Yeah. yeah, so I guess shape does have a little bit of a significance. I mean, to it, it. Is it, would it be fair to say that a throatless or an open throat, whatever we want to call it, would be slightly head lighter compared to one of these because there's there's graphite here whereas on this one there's no graphite um I th it varies so much i mean you can put you can put more material underneath the grip i mean i've seen that yeah. plenty of times uh if you strip the grip off then you'll find like a lead sheet underneath there so you can i, I don't think i don't think the balance is this there's no there's no clear cut uh open throat bracket close Crow's throated racket are head heavy or head light. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's not a, a, a fair, um, fair yeah. thing like that. All right, then. Maybe, maybe, maybe leading on to a, another one of the um, terminologies that you had on your list. Um, so balance point, I always think a better, a better characteristic to know is, uh, is swing weight. Swing weight, yeah. Which is a combination of uh, the weight and the balance together. So what the racket's like in motion. Um, and I think that is is a more useful figure than just balance point. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah, so you can have uh, a really light racket that's massively head heavy and yeah. feels heavier when you're swinging it than a heavy racket that's that's head light. So, yeah. Um, yeah. What I do is when, when I I tell my pupils, if you want to know the weight of a racket, hold it like this. Yeah. And you just close your eyes and you just hold it like this and you can put another one and you can say whether that's heavier or lighter. You, you can generally tell the difference. If you want to know how a racket feels, hold it like this, um, yeah. which is what you're saying. Now, is there a quick yeah. way to measure swing weight? Um, there isn't a quick way. <laughs> um, there, there are some, Heath Roberts, some ways that you can do it yourself, um, but it involves a little bit of setup. Um, so the classic way is you'd get um, two hooks or prongs and bounce balance the racket on one of the strings. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then you swing it. Oh, okay. Time how long it takes to do oh. um, an oscillation. Yeah. And then that oh. time is different for every for every. People wouldn't be able to tell the difference if they did that themselves. No, 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 no. I mean, I've. Um, being a, being a bit of a nerd, I've made a little machine for doing it. So the, okay. the kind of the um, the standard industrial way of the industry way of doing it is that they, they mount the racket like like that, and then yeah. it swings, and they time how long it takes to swing, swing mm -hmm. like that. So there's okay. a machine that does that. It's quite a few thousand pounds to buy that machine. Sure, so, sure. Um, so I've done it a cheaper way. Yeah. I've also seen um, an, an algorithm where you can take the weight of the racket and its balance point and do a little bit of, you know, calculation, and it gives you like a number. Um, now, if you have nothing else, then it can be quite useful, but whether it's, you know, actually applicable in real world, I, I don't know, I haven't really done enough tests for that. Yeah. I mean, something that I do quite often in the shop when I'm selling a racket and someone's torn between which racket feels when you're picking a racket up and what do I like the balance of that is, yeah. um, give me the rackets, you stand one end of the shop, Close your eyes. I've yeah. got one racket. And Absolutely. Swing it. Right now, number two, swing it, and then which make it on that. Which which feels right in your hand when you're swinging it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's that's swing weight. Yeah, it is. It is. It's just how, how it feels. You're absolutely right. And and viewers need to know that there is no right or wrong. There is no head heavy is better for this type of player. It really isn't. As I mentioned in one of my other videos before, you've got to find a racket that you like the feel of. Forget what everybody else tells you. You know, do it like Jeff does, close your eyes, and whatever one feels the best, you're more likely to enjoy playing with that one and play better as well. So, all right, good. All right, so next on the list, let's let's get a little bit more technical and let's talk about talk. Okay. Talk, For, talk. force times distance. <laughs> force times distance, okay, here we go, physics. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you're holding the racket, uh, the distance from your hand to where the ball hits. Um, that's that's the distance and the force is the the impact force with the ball onto onto the racket. So the further away from your hand the ball hits, the more torque is on your is on your wrist. Okay, that's all right. My, um, and the, sorry, I said that's my understanding of torque. Yeah, okay. Um, so we want to be clear here. We don't. Want, we're not suggesting that people hit the ball here because then the distance is further. 
Are we? No. no. <laughs> We're not doing that. <laughs> no, no, but depend. I mean, if you're just trying to measure how much torque is on your hand, then that, okay. that's how you calculate it. That's what I'm talking about. All right, okay. So when you see manufacturers maybe talking about torque, uh, it's maybe just in, in the case of um, this situation, they're just trying to promote something that is almost impossible to measure within a real world situation and have very little effect on. All right, okay. <laughs> All right, okay. okay good. All right, vibration. Yeah. Now, I think that there are a few different types. I've been doing a little bit of reading, but most of it's to do with the tennis rackets. I don't know whether how different that is, but to tell me about vibration within a squat racket. Um, so, depending on the geometry of the frame, uh -huh. um, you'll have You'll have a, a, a stiff racket or a flexible racket. They both vibrate when the ball hits the strings. They mm -hmm. both vibrate, but they vibrate at different amplitudes. Okay. So you feel that you have a different sensation when the ball hits the hits the racket. Um, a really uh, really easy way to to test the vibration and, and things like vibration dampers is probably where you're leading to as well. Yeah. Okay. Or not? If you hold the racket just between yeah, your finger, finger and thumb above the, oh, yeah, above the handle, yeah. and then tap in bed. You can feel okay. the vibrations coming through your, coming through your finger. Right. Okay. Uh, and if you put a vibration dampener in there and do the same thing, you can see for yourself whether it takes out vibrations or not. All right. So what we're essentially saying is that these vibration dampeners don't do anything. No. 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 no they change. They change how the how, how the ball sounds. On right. the strings, and you either like that sound or you don't. But in mechanical um, properties, it doesn't actually doesn't actually yeah. take vibration. Okay. And does a stiff racket uh, transmit more vibration than a flexible racket? Just a different vibration. It's a different vibration. It's just the amplitude. At, and in this case, we're talking about the the number of movements per second. Um, yep. And it does, and it does, it, it, it uh, do you know what the regular amplitude is? I, I remember reading somewhere recently. Anyway, what I remember yeah. reading is that it's like six or between six and 10 milliseconds between the ball hitting and you actually feeling that you've hit it. Um, mm. That's to do with the, the vibration coming down the racket. So there's not more or less vibration because of a stiff or a flexible racket, just a different amplitude. Just a, just a different type. Uh, and um, I think uh, I get quite a lot of people that come into the shop with tennis elbow type of problems okay. and vibrations aggravate their tennis elbow more than other vibrations. Okay. So uh, if you have some sort of elbow injury, um, yeah. then you know, messing about with different vibrations might help. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, let's move on to strings now. Um, we talked about the patterns and things. Can we talk about a little bit about the construction of strings? Okay, yep. Um, so uh, I would say start off with, uh, have I got any string pads? Uh, yeah. So you've got solid core strings, which is just like one solid extrusion. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is what you see in squash generally. Uh, then solid core with a, with a wrap around the outside of it. Um, I've got a head. Packet head string there. I don't know whether you can see. Yeah, I'll try to get some images to sort of overlay. Yeah, it's got multi-filament, which means it's got lots of strands running through through the strings. So that's the other type of construction you see. But it's got um, a core, it's got like a um, uh, a covering around it, around it as well. It's like it's like a like a bundle of fibres with, yeah. with a covering around the outside of it. And, uh, is, and the, you, is the sorry is the cover made of the same material as the inner fibres? It can be, or it can be different. Yeah. Okay. All right. What what type of material is used generally in these kind of things? So uh, nylon's one that you see quite a lot. Um, uh, that's generally when you buy a racket straight off the shelf. If it's been strung uh, in a factory, then it'll generally be strung with a nylon solid core string. Um, then, which probably I'll try and get really close. Which probably looks yeah, it's not it's not focusing, but probably looks like that. This is the original string that came with the racket. Um, yeah. He's not focusing, but very cheap, um, not particularly good. Uh, 
not very good for very long. Yeah, yeah. So okay, all right, yeah, that's a fair point. Very quickly. So I'd say yeah, for the first couple of hits uh, with a cheap string, uh, a cheap solid core nylon string. First couple of hits, they feel lovely, and then they quickly they. Oh, they okay. Detail. Um, then the other string material that I see a lot of in squash is polyurethane. Yeah. Um, lots of multi-filament polyurethane type of strings. Do you get a solid um, core polyurethane? Uh, I've not come across a solid core polyurethane. Okay. There probably is one out there, but uh, not, not one that I've, not one that I've uh, come across. Okay. Um, and then the other really popular string material, which you do a lot of, it, I do a lot of in tennis, but not not in squash uh, is polyester so you see polyester, polyester. all right okay and why don't why don't they use that in in squash or why don't you think they use it uh so polyester is a really stiff material um so in tennis it's for crushing the ball and helping impart spin um for squash i don't think it really it doesn't it doesn't really doesn't really work the same way all right okay um, in the same tension ranges um, and yeah I, I've, I have tried it in my racket and it just plays really dead and horrible yeah. okay all right fair enough and um, synthetic gut so anything that's not natural gut is synthetic gut so nylon polyurethane okay I didn't know that yeah I thought that they actually made something to tr that was like you know like to, to be as close to natural gut as possible. I didn't realize that essentially, if it's not gut, it's synthetic gut. <laughs> right, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, manufacturers have messed about with different kind of fiber shapes running through the string. So natural gut is, uh, is ribbon shaped rather than um, like a, a, a round strand. Ribbon um, shaped? Yeah, so like kind of like a flat. flat. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Interesting, okay. Yeah. Uh, if you get it under a microscope, you can have a look and see. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking of um, a couple of years ago doing a, a um, an April Fool's joke of putting some like it's literally flat material because when you think about it, you think, well, if it's flat, it's got more surface area that's touching the ball. I was going to do like a a little thing about it, but so they do it. But but I mean, if you were to look at it, could you see that it's a ribbon compared to a, no? You really have to look. Not with a naked eye, yeah, you need some sort of magnification to be able to see. Oh, it. Okay. okay, and let's talk uh, briefly about the shape of the string. We, we talk, as you just said, maybe more ribbon, but are all the strings perfectly round or are some of them hexagon? Or So polyester strings, generally because it's one, one extrusion, then they can mess about with different shapes. Plates. So you get lots of different shapes with polyester strings. For squash? Uh, well, like I said, uh, so polyester don't generally use it in squash rackets. Okay. So, so, um, you, the, the closest you get to it, I think, with squash is the type of wrap that they put around the outside of the string. Right. So um, if you run your fingers over it, then it's not a shape, but there's a texture to some of the other some of those. Yeah, okay. Rackets. So, yeah, some of them are smooth. I mean, I always feel that Technifiber, um, like the 305, the typical one that people put in, is yeah. very smooth, almost sticky and then some of the other asher ways so this is I, I think this is super nick xl um yeah. this really feels as though it's got like a texture to it um yeah yeah in fact um one of my one of my favorite stories is i had a customer i was stringing for a while she waited uh, and just chatting and i said well, what is it you do for a living and she said this morning i've been taking pictures of spiders feet uh, under a microscope Okay. So she's uh, like a, a very powerful electron microscope for doing stuff. I said, well, I've always been intrigued as to whether those those pictures that I showed on the string packet, do the, does the string actually look like that? Or not? Like that, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll take some and take a picture for, it, for you. Oh, okay. I've got some uh, some high resolution images of, I think it was Super Nick she took a picture of for me. And you can okay. see the different, uh, around the wrap, the, the outside you can see the different diameters and different shapes of fibers that, that are in there wow that's pretty cool okay let's let's hope that you can send me those and we can add them to the add them to I'll the, dig them up. <laughs> right. okay so let's move on to something called gauge can you tell me what gauge is please jeff um so that's that's very straightforward that's just the diameter of the string okay um, so uh i say straightforward but the, the bigger the number the thinner the string so okay. 17, 
17 gauge string is uh, fatter than 18 gauge string for the bigger diameter. Yeah. Okay. And do you know why that is? I've got no idea either. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's one of those kind of like uh, feet and inches type of measurements. Do it, but I don't think it has any kind of. <laughs> okay, all right. Doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. Behind it, yes, yeah, it's, it's it's wire gauge, so it's the same with like electrical wires that you know. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Now, what is the biggest gauge? And when I say biggest, I mean physically. You know, the actual diameter of what's the biggest gauge a squash uh, string would be? Ooh. Uh, so pretty. Probably be able to squeeze a 15 L in, maybe. A 15 um, L. Yeah. So yeah. So, uh, so there's uh, within the gauges you get light, <laughs> light and yeah. So oh, there's, right. an, there's, a, there's an intermediary between 15 and 16. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I would say 1.3 millimeters. It's easier to talk in millimeters. 1. Yeah, 3. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, 1.3. Um, and of course, sorry, that's limited by the size of the holes in the grommets. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Is, it, is it possible that if you wanted some weirdo like me might come into your shop one day and say, "Look, I want you to drill holes a little bit bigger." <laughs> <laughs> please, please don't do that to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose you could. You could, but you obviously you uh, you're damaging the integrity of the frame if you put a bigger hole in. Uh, the only t the only time I've 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 done it is uh, when we've had uh, a squash racket that had no grommets in it. <gasps> my pet hates, and I wanted to put some tubing in to oh, it pick okay. the edge. I wanted to put some tubing in, uh, but the hole wasn't big enough to get the, the tubing in. That's the only time that I've uh, I've actually physically drilled. A racket to get a racket. So tubing would essentially be just a thin piece of it's like a tube of plastic that is used to replace individual grommets when the grommet itself has broken. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. That's uh, yeah. that's a piece of yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just, uh, um, if you uh, if the grommet breaks or cracks, uh, then there's a chance the string will touch the sharp touch the edge. Prime. Yeah, touch the frame and break the string. So you either replace it with a piece of tubing uh, or you could grind the grommet out and just replace it with a, an individual grommet like that. Like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then the thinnest would be 19? Well, yeah. or one point or one point one, I think it is. Point one, one point yeah, that's what I was going to say. Now, it doesn't sound much, does it? The difference between 1.1 1 .1 millimeter and 1.3 millimeter. I mean, it's like point two millimeters it, it, it sounds nothing but it really does seem to make a difference a lot of people like very thin strings other people like me like very wide or fat fat strings as i like to, to call them um yeah and do most strings come in different gauges mm. so uh, yes but not necessarily. So, like three hundred five, for instance, you can get in lots of different gauges. Yeah. Um, but um, generally, it'll change the name of the string if they, if you get a different gauge of it. So okay. call it something. Yeah. All right. And would you say that there is any particular, a bit like we talked about with the frames? Like you can't say that you know uh, a, a teardrop racket is head heavy. You wouldn't say that a a higher gauge or a thicker a thicker string is better for power or, or or control there wouldn't be that black and white it's this if it's this if it's this no no i don't i don't think it's a black and a white no no i think um kind of leading on to one of your one of the topics to you that you've listed down which is like kind of how the ball plays off the strings the um the trampoline trampoline in effect yeah then um the strings stretch differently depending on their on their gauge and you don't necessarily, well, you, you probably do lose a little bit of power depending on how the ball compresses, but they just, they feel differently. And then it's your perception of that feel, whether you feel like it's more power or, okay. or not. Yeah. yeah. So, so the trampolining is how much the string depresses or, I mean, I say depress, maybe the proper word is compress. No, that wouldn't be the right word. I, I, th I think of it uh, the opposite way around, the effect it has on the ball. So oh. what it does, the ball, so the ball compresses, completely squashes, yeah. or it, it compresses less, it pockets on the, uh, on the string. Bed, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So if we do think of a trampoline and we drop a ball, the ball doesn't change the shape, 
the, the strings change the shape. That's what we're yeah. saying, really. It's, in some ways, I don't know that it's a great analogy, a trampoline, because you think of a trampoline as you jumping up and down onto it. Yeah. It was just like a hard, bony structure, as opposed to a rubber ball. And a rubber ball reacts completely differently to your yeah. leg. Yeah. And of course, that's why our sport is called our sport, because the ball squashes. That's, that's yeah. why it, it, it squashes. Um, so the gauge and the tension and the construction of the string affect the amount of trampolining. So they, those three things affect, uh, going back to the terminology, the string bed stiffness. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right, okay. So you play, you play tunes with the string type and the tensions to uh, change the stiffness of the string plane. Yeah, that's why. I... Uh, no, <laughs> so, and then that changes how the ball reacts off of it. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, that's why I sort of tell a lot of people um, that... It, it's not a simple science, it's an art, because it's the combination of so many different factors, the, the frame shape, the frame rigidity, the frame construction, the type of string, the stringing pattern, the tension that you put it at, the size of the gauge, the size of, the, all of those things go together, that everyone is a small change, that it's just not possible to just have a simple guide that you could just say, oh, I, I'm this player, I'm this old, I like this string, it's this tension. It's not that simple. And a lot of those characteristics that define how those things work aren't available to you. So how stretchy is a string at a certain tension range? Mm. They publish that number? No, they don't. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. All right, and, and that's that's good because you talked about tension. Now, on this particular one, this this is the Ashaway Powerkill 110 SL. It's got string tension 20 to 28 pounds. Now that would be what we would call the tension range. That's the recommended tension range for that racket. It doesn't say for different strings, but it's, I suppose that's the same for all strings within this racket. The manufacturer th thinks, feels, that if you go beyond those limits, you're not going to get the best out of the frame. Yeah, yeah. I, I always think of it um, as giving you an ind indication of how strong the racket is okay. so not so if you see a, a 28 then you know that you can string up, up to 28 it's comfortable it'll it'll perform you're not going to cause any damage yeah to that high tension range yeah oh. but it's kind of nonsensical to to put a, a recommended tension range on and not specify what what type of string because one string at 28 pounds plays completely different to another string at 28 pounds so yeah it, well, yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, you, what you're saying is that anything beyond 28 pounds, you might break your racket, in which then asks the question, why bother putting a, a lower range? Because you, there's, there's, no, there's no limit yep. to the lower. You can have one pound, okay, it's going to play terrible, but you could still have it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do strings come with tension ranges as well? I mean, like you, you held up the, the, the head string. Does it mm -hmm. say on that particular string... We recommend this strong, this no. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, most of the time what you get is um, a chart on the back that says power, durability, feel, and okay. they're always eight, eight or nine. Yeah. Because why would you say that your string didn't play at the, <laughs> at the top end of that spectrum? So yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, the, the, the information that you get off the string pack, packet doesn't really, doesn't really tell you very much. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, and, Sorry, uh, say that again? That doesn't really give you any useful information. Yeah, yeah. And um, another video I'm going to make with, uh, with John, uh, String Doctor, is about the terminology that people use, that manufacturers use. So that's like a separate one. And, and it's the same kind of idea that these strings will give you the maximum power and the maximum control. And well, that's strange because they all say that. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so I'd like to go on to what I know as, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, it is hybrid stringing patterns. And now what I mean by that is having a different string for the mains and a different string for the crosses. Can you talk me through that? Because at the moment, I've never done that. I've never played with a racket that has that. So it's completely new for me. Yeah, I mean, that, that is exactly what I would think of as, as a hybrid stringing pattern. Um, I think the uh, historically, uh, certainly for me anyway, uh, you would string hybrid if you've got one string that uh, 
take polyester or Kevlar, for instance, which is very hard wearing, very stiff string. This is more tennis focused, <laughs> not, not so much squash. Uh, and you want to soften it up and make it a little bit more playable. So okay. then you put a string in to try and um, counteract. So, you, so you're trying to get the best of both string characteristics. You could argue that you're getting the worst of both string characteristics. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Okay. But uh, that's, that's the reason why I do it. Um, the only hybrid stringing I've done in squash would be I'd change the gauge. So maybe have a thicker, same string type, have a thicker gauge in the mains and a thinner gauge in the crosses. Okay. Um, for durability for, uh, reasons. All right. And is it normally that the, the main strings, the vertical strings down here, just to remind people, those are the ones that would be the stronger, thicker strings, and then the crosses would be the more flexible, the thinner strings. Is that generally how it works? That, that's generally how it works, yeah. But again, you can play tunes with that and you can mess about with it and change it if you want. But yeah, as a general rule, um, you, the, the main string is the one that's going to break. So that's the one that takes the most force, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to think back in all the years I've been playing, which string breaks the most. I suppose it's, I suppose it's oh. the main. Um, yeah. Not not always for me, but okay, all right. And um, um, going back to string construction again, we didn't really talk so much about natural gut. Do you find that people still use that? I haven't used natural gut in a squash racket in, yeah, for no, 30 no. years. I mean, are they still available? Um, short answer is, I mean, I used to get my natural gut from a company called Bow Brand. Um, oh, I haven't heard that name in years. <laughs> Oh, they it all, used to have like the red, red and black logo, didn't it? I'm, I'm struggling to recall what their logo looked like. Now. Okay, yeah, bow brand, crikey! Since I since I strung in natural gut, um, and I mean they they make strings for musical instruments, and they ditched the um, strings for uh, racket sports to just do the musical instruments ones because there wasn't a demand. Okay, enough demand. Uh, and that's certainly something that I see through the shop. But, yeah. I, Nobody. I can't being asked for natural gut in a squash racket. Right? Yeah, yeah. But it still happens in tennis. People still have it in tennis. Yeah, so t tennis generally they'll do it as a hybrid. So what we were talking about before where you've got a polyester and a natural gut as a hybrid. And the, and, the, and, the, and the natural gut is the cross string? Again, depends. You can, you can change it. You can have it either way. All right, okay. All right. <laughs> so lastly, I want to talk about the sweet spot. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. I said I sound really evasive, don't I? But yeah. <laughs> no, no, you don't, because as we so talked about earlier, it's not this binary. It's not one or zero, black or white. It's just you can base somebody can come in and just ask for for pretty much anything, um, yeah. you know. So it's not that you're evasive. It's just that there is no simple simple answer. Um, sweet spot. I've been doing a yes. bit of research, and I didn't okay. know that there are three sweet spots. At least in tennis. <laughs> now, I think for most of us, we don't really need to worry about the, the difference in. But do you want to talk me through talk me through the sweet spot in case people don't know what that is? So, I think what most people think of when they when they talk about sweet spot is the area that gives you the least amount of vibrations when okay. the ball hits. Yeah. Um, it's actually it's actually not a spot. Uh, if you were to draw, it's, it's normally like kind of smiley face shape um, that goes across the racket face like that. Um, that test that I was talking about earlier where you hold the racket. Oh, um, yeah, okay. You, when you hit it. If you do that, you can find it. So you can feel where, all right, I'm on the sweet spot there, which is on this racket is that point there. That point, yeah. Uh, is it a coincidence you, that the, the, the spot of the head logo is actually the sweet spot? Is that a coincidence? <laughs> <laughs> well, they designed it like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I've always thought of sweet spots as sort of like this this area that is more shaped like the frame of the racket. But but you're saying it's it's more. It's yeah. So more it's like, like it's like a line. Yeah. Yeah. So if you do that, if you do that thing when you've got spare ten minutes with the ball, yeah. and you hit it near the frame, you can find where where you can't feel the vibrations and then you can you can track it in an arc mm -hmm. around the racket no, I, you'll wear it what i do i don't know if it's good or bad i put the racket on the floor can't demonstrate now i stand on it with one foot so that it's got a lot of weight and then i drop a ball 
And what that takes out is it takes out any of the frame character will. It reduces the frame characteristics. And you can really see where the ball bounces in a different place and how much it comes back. It's, it's like quite a, quite a good test. I actually do it because I'm trying to tell people not to move their wrist when they make contact with the ball. That's the real reason of it, because if you hit the ball and then you make a small twist, you're not transferring all of the energy into the ball. And the way to sort of see that work is by putting your foot on and you sort of you know, you bounce it. I'm doing it on the table now. And it almost works on the table. Um, so I don't know whether that's an equivalent way of finding the sweet spot, but I sort of, it works for me. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether that's the, like you said at the beginning, there's three different types of sweet spots. Yeah. Dragging my memory banks now, centre of percussion and things like that. I think, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was yeah. quite reading it, but it was a bit over my head. Yeah, I don't think what you're measuring there is the same thing as the vibration. Uh, okay. So what you're feeling in your hand, the, the sweet spot, you know, when it kind of like you hit the ball and shank it and you go, ah, God, that, uh, I didn't like yeah. that. Oh, there, that feels sweet there. Yeah. That's the missions that you're feeling. And yeah, that's, yeah. I don't think you can test that by clamping the racket down solidly and... No, because you're not getting any vibration coming back, though. No. All, right. All right, well, I think we've covered everything on the list. Um, and stencils. I know it's like a silly one. It's not like really technical and really important, but people might not know what they are. So tell, have you got a stencil to hand? No. Yes? Wait one second. One second. <laughs> Since I had a head racket in my hand. Okay, go. yeah, fair enough. I um, I'll, I'll edit that out. Right. Okay. So that's a that's a stencil. It goes on top. Oh, you don't want to see you don't want to see logos then, is that? <laughs> oh no, I'm okay with logos. Yeah, I don't I don't mind about logos. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, yeah. yeah. So if you're if you're stenciling that pattern onto onto the racket, against, then you put it, put it against your um your your t-shirt because we can't see it when it's up like that. <laughs> uh, see it if I have something a bit a bit lighter, but I haven't. Can you can you see it now? Yeah, yeah, better. Oh, oh. All right, there we go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah so you can see. Uh, so you put it down on there, then you have a, a pen. Yeah, it's uh, not a big bottle. thick ink pen, isn't and it? Ink bottle with like kind of a felt top with loads of stencil in it, and then you draw and you tap it down on there. You can see where where the ed where I've gone <laughs> around the edges. Yeah, and then they do the same on the other side, and there you go. You've got your stencil. Yeah, it's exactly. A simple and um, you can you can make your own stencils. I mean, you could you could put your own stencils for your own shop on there. And I know that Spin Doc does yeah. John. He does like a few different ones. He does his own. Um, yeah, yeah. I I I used to do uh, lots of silly patterns. It started off being for juniors, okay. and then actually I get more adults ask me for stupid stencils than I do juniors now. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a, like it's a fun way of customising your racket a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Jazz it up a little bit. Yeah. Make it individual. Um, a lot of times, uh, certainly with the badminton customers that I have, when they're playing in a big hall and they put their racket down on the side, it means that they can see which one is their racket from a distance as well. Yeah, okay. So put, putting their initials on or putting numbers on, if it's like someone's getting the racket restrung for their birthday, then put a number on there. All right, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. I suppose if you've got a lot of rackets, you could number the rackets so you know which one is which. Maybe they all look the same yeah. otherwise. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. I don't know, maybe there would be another one. All right, okay, well, great. So I want to thank you for um, taking the time and explaining things. Um, You're welcome. If viewers have got questions about the technical terms that are used in rackets and strings that we haven't covered, I'm hoping that that's not the case, but there might be some terms that, that, that we haven't covered. If there are, ask in the comments, and either myself or Jeff will try and answer them to the best of our ability. Um, anything that you want to add? Is there anything that you thought that I was going to ask but didn't? No, I think um, I, when we first started the call I said I'm, I'm going to struggle to make this last more than five minutes. So, All right. And, yeah, no, you've <laughs> more, more than... Than we needed to. Alright, yeah. perfect. Well, that's it. Thanks very much. Have a good um, good luck reopening um, and good luck restringing again. And um, I'm sure we'll make a video in the future about something to do with uh, stringing and brackets and everything. Alright, that's it. We're finished. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Bye.
Well, that was the uh, terminology video, the frame and string terminology video. I hope that you enjoyed it. On the screen at the moment is a subscription button. If and only if you think my content is useful, please consider subscribing. On the screen also is a playlist. I'm not sure what it's going to be. It's going to be a random one, so check it out. And there's also a video that YouTube thinks is a good fit for you based on what you've been watching. And remember, do something every single day to improve your squash. See ya.